Perfect. Welcome, everybody. We are a number of people. Uh, this is the first lecture of this year uh, in the Open Science Seminar in Basel, which is also the uh, part of the reproducibility Basel. Um, I'm here with, uh, I'm Francesco Santini with my colleagues, uh, uh, Xeni Deliani, Tuba, uh, Akinji Nantonoli, and Claudia Weinsteiner. We are the organizers of this series of lectures. And today we have uh, Cassandra Goldman Prague. Uh, I'm really happy that we have her because she's uh, one of my favorite speakers uh, and uh, uh, I believe she's a really great person overall. Um, we already had actually uh, a, a different uh, conversation with her uh, in a different context with the reproducibility study group of the ISMRM, which will also be on YouTube, uh, uh, but a bit later. So we will have this video first. So if you're watching offline at some point, uh, uh, I will uh, edit the description of this video to also add uh, a video to the uh, other conversation that we had with Cassandra. Uh, just uh, a small introduction, uh, Cassandra works to generate opportunities for our research community to actively participate in and contribute to open science infrastructure at the Welcome Center for Integrated Neuroimaging at the University of Oxford. She works between departments and alongside partners in other institutions to develop policies and recommendations for good governance around open science that work for individual facilities across departmental boundaries within medical sciences and beyond into the wider university, national and international networks. She has a PhD in informatics, Master of Science in Cognitive Neuroscience and Bachelor of Science in Human Biology. She was co-chair of the Organization of Human Brain Mapping Open Science Room 2020 and has spoken about open science and inclusivity at a number of national and international meetings. She is an active contributor to a number of open community tools, including Open Research Calendar, the COVID as checklist, and the Turing Way. And uh, today she's going to give us uh, uh, a great introduction to uh, open and reproducible science. Uh, and I really believe that she is the best person to uh, give this lecture. So thank you very much for being here with us, Cassandra. And uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, instantly lost my unmute button, which hopefully I've now found. Um, I'm going to try and remember that my camera is on a different screen to my slides. So here I am looking at the slides, so I'm going to pretend that I can see you there as well. And I can see the chat um, in the corner of my eye. So um, if someone wants to chair the chat for me, that would be wonderful. If there's something that you think I should be aware of in the chat, just please, um, Francesca, is any, just stop me and I'm happy to take questions of clarification through. Um, otherwise we can have the discussion at the end, it'd be lovely. Uh, thank you so much for that really kind introduction. I've really enjoyed the opportunity um, since the summer to connect more closely with other reproducibility groups uh, like around Europe mostly but um yeah so thank you again for this invitation to to speak and to meet you all right let's get into it so I'm going to be giving you an introduction to transparency reproducibility and open science and uh focusing um on the motivations why it's necessary and uh why I think it's necessary um and why we do it and also some sort of practical guidance on how you can start to practice open science um, can i just confirm like are we all scientists or are, are like humanities folks in this group we're all broadly stem like if i say open science am i being really exclusionary no historians okay cool open everything not just science that's just the way i use it um, so as Francesca said, I'm the Open Science Community Engagement Coordinator at the Welcome Imaging Centre at Oxford, and my job is to um, make it easy and um, pleasurable for people to do open science at our institution, and I'm incredibly pleased and proud to have the job that I do. Oh, there we go. Uh, so first, I, I always um, put my thanks at the beginning of my talks because uh, I'm not going to wait until the end to thank everybody that all of everything that I'm going to talk about today is um, 
a culmination of experiences from working with these many different people. So thank you to all of these folks in here and I'm sure many more in the background as well. So this talk today, I'm going to start with um, what are the problems that open science and reproducibility and open data aim to address? And then I want to uh, sort of show you where I've encountered these problems in my career as a scientist or for the, the first points that I started encountering them. And I've called this part, this stuff is very normal. Um, partly to um, make me feel better about it, but also to help you see that um, it's when you encounter these things, you're not alone. Uh, it's, it wasn't your, it's not your fault. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about the solutions that are available to help um, improve transparency and reduce problems around reproducibility. And those solutions are both practical, but there's also some policy moves that are coming through. And then I'll close by uh, kind of inviting you to connect with your community, um, which you're all doing by coming to this event and um, speak to you a little bit about the power of community. So what are the problems which open science and open data aim to address? Well, first there is, um, we, we should reflect on and accept the fact that research is done by humans. We are humans and we are motivated. Um, we, are, we can be incentivized. We can be biased. We can be negligent and we can conduct fraud. We can do bad things intentionally, or we can do things um, unintentionally. And I think much of the problem that we're seeing in um, with issues of reproducibility is not so much the fraudulent things, not people in intentionally doing bad work, but it's more about how we're incentivized in this business of research and how those, um, how those incentives bias the decisions that we make um, so I, I kind of increasingly now I would like to make sure that people are aware that nothing that we do is in uh, isolation of our experiences. So everything that has led up to your point in your career at the moment, you will be influenced by your past and um, your future aspirations. So we're not, we're not machines, we, all, we will do things wrong sometimes. And with incentives, the, the biggest, I think, influence comes from um, publication bias. And so we are encouraged to publish regularly. We should be publishing exciting results in high impact journals. And we also need to make sure that our work is cited, that other people are talking about it. And these incentives um, come from our institutions, but also in uh, across institutions. When we are applying for jobs, we're trying to move to different places. The, the people that will get the interviews are the people with the papers and those papers in exciting journals. Now, unfortunately, uh, according to the journals, replications, really robust replication work is not exciting. So that's not gonna get into a high impact journal. Null results are not exciting and yeah, at all times, we're encouraged to tell a story which supports our hypothesis. So the stories that we tell need to be simple. We need to uh, take the reader on a very simple journey. And as most of you, I'm sure, will appreciate, the business of doing science is not simple. Whose experiments ever go right the first time? Uh, certainly not mine. So this incentive structure has led to a publication bias so that certain things are published and certain, aren't, certain others aren't. And the image here is a representation, representation of um, something called the file drawer effect, where the published studies are the ones we tell everyone about, but the boring studies, the null results or the replications, or the ones that didn't fit our, our hypotheses, they are hidden away in our file drawer and no one gets to hear about them. Now this plays out in um, randomized controlled trials, RCTs, clinical trials, where positive findings are four times more likely to be submitted and published than trials with null, null results. And they are also published earlier, two to three years earlier than trials with negative findings. And they're also more likely to be published in English or journals with a high impact factor. Now this, I think, it, it, well, this is um, 
a, a massive problem in the system that uh, important things are published in English. So if you can't publish in English too easily, then your results and your research doesn't get the um, attention that it, should, that it should. Lots of nasty things run back in there. So uh, this is just to say this, in, this incentive structure exists and the impact of this incentive structure is that the literature that is available to us um, is biased and can be misleading. And we contribute to this by not sharing all of our uh, findings. Oops, where's my slide? There we go. So um, before, uh, when, when we were arranging this talk, I was asked to um, provide some questions for multiple choice. So this is the first of a multiple choice question. And I think Zenny's got um, a Zoom poll to bring up. Thank you. So here, um, the answer will be on the slide after the poll's closed. But the first, just to kind of give you uh, an idea of the scope of this issue. The question is, um, in 2011, so a few years ago, um, a healthcare company attempted to replicate the results of 67 published drug trials. What percentage of these studies do folks think could not be replicated? Um, how does this work with the results? So make your choice. How many? Um, so half of the people have participated so far. Oh, I need to I, participate as well. I wait. And then I, I think I end the poll and we can see the result. Great. So as a result of this publication bias and these incentive structures, and this need to have a hypothesis and need to make uh, amazing sexy findings. Um, how has this impacted the reproducibility of our work? Great. We're all completely uh, skeptical and jaded. The answer is uh, in 2011, 64% of the studies that people uh, that Bayer tried to replicate could not be replicated. So if you transfer this to your field, um, imagine 64% of the papers, 64% um, of the papers that you're reading uh, have findings that couldn't be replicated. And to me, that's a, a really um, a scary result, especially considering the sort of extent of the reading that we all do. Uh, next question. How's my black box for this one? Yeah. Um, so the impact of this poor reproducibility because of bias and incentives um, is not only like annoying for us, it's also there's massive financial implications as well. Um, it is expensive to be doing work which we can't be confident in because it costs us um, the charities and things that are funding us are paying for us to paying for us to actually demonstrate valuable things. But how much of that money is being wasted? Not only finance, like money and time, but also, for example, animals. How many studies um, have been conducted using animals that uh, are not robust findings, but are presented as such? So the question is, um, what's the estimated spend on preclinical studies, which cannot be reproduced? And I've forgotten the answer, so I'm just going to go. How are we doing on the poll? Lovely. And you guessed it. It's lots. Lots of money is being spent uh, and you could argue is being wasted. Um, and I think this is awful news for the taxpayer. They, when the sort of general public hear about these things, they are rightly enraged, depending on who you speak to. Um, but yeah, I think the time as well that goes into this and also the, the resources and the animals and I'm sure the carbon that goes into this is all, all um, not a good thing. That's something that we should be trying to remove. And then one more question. So this was um, a survey of researchers. Um, this is, came out in Nature in 2016. And uh, researchers were asked, is there a reproducibility crisis? And most of them agreed, yes, there was. This was 2016, remember? 
Um, and if they agreed there was a reproducibility crisis, what do they think was the most, um, the highest contributing factor to that? Did they think it's fraud? Do they think it's poor experimental design? Everyone else is doing rubbish science, and that's why we can't reproduce their findings. Or was it selective reporting? Wait another second. Great. Yeah. I wasn't sure about this quiz if I should just be really mean or actually just uh, give you the easy answer, obvious answers. So yes, selective reporting and pressure to publish incentives is what people recognized as being the most important contributors to poor reproducibility, like science that doesn't hold up. And I think this is interesting because this is people reflecting on their own motivations and their own sort of understandings of what it's like to work in this system. So, but the incentives wasn't the only contributing factor. Uh, Poor methods, people do recognize that uh, selective reporting is publication bias. So not telling the full story of what happened. So not reporting studies. And also I'll give you a more sort of explicit example as well later on, if that's okay. So um, people do generally think that um, it's hard for me to replicate your study because you did a bad study. For example, you didn't have, um, your statistics weren't strong enough. You didn't provide enough information for me to replicate your study. You had a poor design um, or you weren't um, clear enough in how you, uh, how you reported the materials that you used and things like this. Another contributor to poor reproducibility it was said to be transparency. So if you don't share your complete methods with someone or with the you know, scientific community, or if you don't share your code, if you use that to analyze your data, then how can you expect someone else to be able to reproduce your, your work if you don't tell them exactly how you do it? Um, and if you don't share your data, how can we check whether I have been able to replicate your findings if you haven't given me all of your data? And then there's also issues around culture. So um, some people believe that the um, mentoring and sort of training that we receive in our studentships is insufficient. And sometimes we don't have, um, our supervisors and, and PIs don't have the time to look carefully through our work to make sure that we're doing everything correctly. And those are fair criticisms. Um, but then there's also the, the further level of things of, of fraud. People, some people may be actually conducting fraud and, and who are these people? Um, but also peer review as well. So uh, in the same way that our supervisors might not have time to check into all the details, sometimes peer reviewers don't have time to look into everything too carefully as well. And those are cultural issues. That's something broader that we need to address in academia. So now hopefully you will agree with me that uh, there is a problem. We've seen that um, there's a financial problem. We've seen that there's a publication bias. It's evidence in the literature that we're not telling the full story. And um, we see that scientists and researchers in general have recognized that this is real and they feel the influence of it themselves. So then I wanted to give you like my personal illustration of where I encountered these kinds of pressures. Um, so here we are, 2013. I see uh, Nick Rothen on the, in the picture smiling because Nick and I were at Sussex together when this happened and I haven't seen him probably since. Um, so here is me handing in my thesis in 2013. Um, and the, the slide, the the text that I'm going to show you next are um, clips from my examiner's reports from my thesis. So I, I um, had a generally reasonably positive PhD experience. It wasn't anything extraordinary. I had a strong um, team around me. I was a, a respectable, in, respectable institution. 
So I think what happens here, what happened and what you'll see is not uh, an exceptional set of circumstances. This is what I mean by it. it's, it's very normal. And at the time I didn't really uh, notice or understand what was happening here. So these are the some of the corrections from my thesis. I had um, minor corrections, which means that they thought it was a good thesis, but it needed a bit of tweaking in order to get the my PhD. So my um, examiner said that um, I need to be explicit about which tests are used to are designed to test my hypothesis, and which are exploratory. And this is um, a fundamental issue in statistical power that um, exploratory tests, you could do thousands of them. And um, the more tests you do, the more likely you are to find a positive result. So they wanted to need to be clear which ones were like a priori decisions and which ones were exploratory. Um, they, uh, uh, the last sort of highlighted bit here about sort of telling a story is that they wanted to make sure that I was aware that this practice is important when it comes to writing a neuroimaging paper. Uh, my PhD is in brain imaging. And it's important in writing a paper, not, they that didn't say that it was important to, in conducting robust, high quality research. So uh, what I did um, is I did some editing in my thesis. I rewrote the chapters and, and made it clear with, um, made my hypotheses more clear. And I also, um, in one of my analysis, I, I excluded, selectively reported. I took away, I stopped talking about the number of tests I did. I told the story that I did fewer tests. The number of seed regions has been reduced. And what I was doing in these exercises of editing, uh, excluding some of my reporting, um, I was probably p-hacking, so um, playing with statistics until I got the numbers that are were significant, and I was probably harking, which is hypothesizing after results are known. I was probably deciding which seed regions to re to leave in, based on which ones gave me the uh, a result that had something that I could tell a story about. And I put like question mark about these things because I wasn't knowingly doing it and I, it was 2013 I can't, I can't even remember exactly what I was doing but there was nothing that I was doing that I felt bad about at the time I remember even I was teaching in statistics and if students told said that they were doing these things in the my statistics classes that I was teaching I would say no 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 that's a bad thing but when it came to doing it for my thesis I felt no uh, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong and surprisingly, nor did my reviewers. They were very impressed with all of my p-hacking and harking and editing, um, and my thesis was approved. And to go back to the idea that what they wanted to emphasize is that the, the report as I had initially written, where I had probably included all of my tests, wasn't what, uh, wasn't publishable. I wouldn't be able to uh, sell a neuroimaging paper in its initial state until I'd done all of that editing and hacking and harking. Now, and what this is, um, the kind of, the theoretical thing, uh, the theoretical point to bring this back to is this um, issue of uh, multiple testing and something called the garden of forking paths, which I think comes from some kind of Greek literature, old stuff, not my thing. But um, if you imagine on the right hand side, you've got this little um, tree. Every statistical test you do, every decision you make is taking you down one option. So if I include um, all of my seed regions or I include the first two or the second three, each of these are decisions that I can make and at each point, I'm going to arrive at a slightly different conclusion based on the decisions I've made. Um, and as it, I've highlighted here, the short version is that it's easy to find a significant result 
if you look hard enough. So if you keep doing tests, you will find something that is positive and that's just uh, an issue of statistics and probability. So multiple comparisons doesn't have to feel like fishing for the right result, but it is fishing. And ultimately the, the problem is, how do we know which was the right path, which is the answer that will actually bring us to the truth of the issue and that truth being the, the sort of the fundamental scientific um, ground of what we're trying to demonstrate. And this can be more or less impactful depending on what um, important thing you're researching. But imagine if it's if it's a drug trial and your uh, decisions are taking you down a path which says compound A is successful. And if you'd chosen a slightly different path, it could have said that compound A is harmful. Oh, it's all right, Laura. Laura says in the chat, I'm sorry to hear this story. I would imagine that many of us have got similar stories. And honestly, it wasn't a problem at the time. And it's only when I reflect back and I think, um, uh, you know, this, this is why I'm here. We can have like a, uh, a thing where we all tell our sadness after the recording has been stopped. And um, yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure that other people will have similar examples. But thank you. So enough of the doom and gloom. Let's go on to solutions. And there are practical and policy based solutions that we can um, implement to improve the transparency of our work and the reproducibility ultimately. So first practical is the uh, open science. Um, so there are many kind of everyone every little group has their own definition of open science and you might hear about it as being like an umbrella term and things and this is the um, definition I came up with a couple of years ago which um, is open science is a system of practices for ensuring transparency and reproducibility of research findings so transparency being um, making your work available for other people to inspect and reproducibility meaning that other people can um, can repeat your experiment either with your data and your methods or by uh, extension with their own methods and their own data or their own tools and to sort of see how it generalizes. So it's all about being open and sharing. So the kind of uh, highlight steps in a reproducible open science um, experiment is that first you pre-register your study. So um, I'm not gonna talk in any detail about what pre-registration means, and I'm sure it will come up in other places in this um, series of events, but pre-registering basically means before you do your work, you say somewhere in as much detail as you can what you're going to do. So that forking path, you say in advance which path you're gonna take or what's gonna, um, how you're going to make your decisions and you put that out there in public and that is uh, should protect you from wandering down too many paths so pre-registering and there's a number of ways you can do that the second uh, way to do open science is to publish or share all of your research outputs or as much as you can so that's your data your code your uh, it could be your code for collecting your data and also for analyzing your data um, how if you the more you can program and the less you can do in spreadsheets the easier it is to share those um that working out in a way that other people can um can interrogate and also everything that you share you should try and make it fair which means findable accessible interoperable and reusable so there's no point um sharing your data in a tweet because how is everyone else going to find it so share your outputs in a place where people know where to look for them that they're indexed by search engine engines search engines um, make your outputs accessible so other people know how you want them to reuse them so you'll see on my slides here that i've got a ccby 4.0 um, uh, that means that you are free to use my slides as long as you credit me somewhere and um, 
there are other versions of this kind of licensing, which means uh, you can use my slides, but I would rather you didn't use them um, to make money from, for example. So uh, accessible and um, uh, reusable means about uh, defining how you want other people to, um, to build on your work. And the question reusable, yes, yeah, so reusable is about licensing as well. And interoperable means like don't share things in proprietary formats. So if you have to share a spreadsheet, share it in a CSV rather than an Excel because not everyone can afford um, Microsoft Office and not everyone should have to use Microsoft Office to interrogate your data. Um, so FAIR is something, if this is your first time about hear, uh, hearing about FAIR, um, you'll hear it everywhere. And there's lots of lovely resources that you can um, pull on to find out how to make your outputs for your um, specific discipline FAIR. I think they did very well by creating an acronym that people can hang on to. So that's an aim in all of our work, make it easy for people to remember what you're talking about. And uh, onto the policy. So you may or may not have heard of this thing called DORA, which is the Declaration of Research Assessment. And this is trying to address the issue of incentives. So DORA have um, a declaration that says, let's stop making impact factor. So uh, nature and, and H index and stuff. Stop making that such an important thing when we come to um, promote and assess researchers. So DORA has been signed by individuals and organisations, um, including my university at Oxford. I don't know if anyone knows if Basel has, has signed it. I know some people, uh, some organisations haven't signed up to DORA, so haven't agreed that this is um, something they want to action because uh, DORA itself has not given a framework of, of how to do this. How do we stop making impact factors so important, they've just said we just want it to be less important. So um, yeah, I know there's some contention there about whether some institutions have signed up. So don't worry if yours hasn't. Um, and then these are some uh, UK specific um, policy actions that uh, have encouraged open science. So UK RI is the, the main government funding source in the UK. And they, um, as I said, they're updating their research strategy to um, they talk about making things fair, they want to um, promote and encourage data sharing. So when uh, folks are applying for money, the funders are saying, we want you to make your outputs available and fair. NIHR is another one in the UK, again, strongly supports the sharing of data in the most appropriate way. And the Wellcome Trust as well. Wellcome Trust were, um, they were the first funder to introduce mandatory open access policies. So good, well done, welcome. And then another place that you'll hear about um, these mandates for sharing and transparency is when you come to publish. So Elsevier um, say that research data should be made available and also spring in nature. And some journals are he more heavy handed on this than others. And uh, some people have um, uh, lots of support as well. In, in preparing your outputs for sharing. So some journals just say share your data and some journals like PLOS um, give you some extra guidance. So on this practical side, um, as you've seen then at the start of your project when uh, you're getting funding, which most PhD students won't, um, won't have seen that, process before. Normally you come to a project when it's already funded, but your PI and at some point you yourself will be uh, might be applying for funding. And at that point, they will be asking you to consider your sharing. And that's really the most, uh, the easiest time to incorporate all of this um, open science and transparency into your work, incorporate into your planning. But at the moment where you are in your um, research journey, think about what is easy for you to achieve now so that you don't need to suddenly make everything you do open and public but think about what is the first um, step you can take into making your work more transparent and reproducible whether that's publishing your code whether that's um, pre-registering or whether it's just connecting with the community what's a, a first action that you can take and then also think about what's your stretch goal so what would be your kind of 
your North Star. Sometimes people say, what's the next, the ultimate aim that you want to get to? But also be aware of what specific complications there are in the work that you do. So in brain imaging, uh, everyone's brain is unique. The, the cortical structure is individual to that person. So brain data is uniquely identifiable, which means we have to handle it very carefully in GDPR. Um, so do does your work come under GDPR? Maybe if you're working with animals, you want to be more careful about who knows that you're working with animals. Um, I was speaking to someone who works with, uh, they work with farmers as their sort of data sample and the farmers don't want their data to be shared because they have a competitive advantage there as well. So there might be some things that are complicated to the work that you do, which means that you um, have to be kind of mindful in, in where you share your data and your other materials. And finally, um, connecting with your community, I think is, I'm a community manager, so I'm biased, but I think community is one of the most powerful tools that we have in this kind of journey of reforming science. And here you are all at a reproducibility event, so you're doing the right thing already. Anyone who's not here, tell them to come. So when you are um, part of a community, you have safety in numbers, which, you know, if we're reflecting back to my kind of thesis experience, if I had been more open about that, or um, if I was hearing these kinds of messages from a community, I perhaps might have um, been a bit more hesitant. I don't know, I probably still would have wanted to just finish my thesis, to be honest, but it would have been uh, at least on my awareness if there was a community talking about it. So it can build your confidence in addressing these kinds of issues. You can share your experience and expertise within your community. And then also when it comes to um, more formal collective action, for example, um, introducing changes to uh, undergraduate teaching, if one person tries to do that themselves, that's not going to be as powerful as if a whole community of people um, support that action and can help sort of resource it. So connect with your community. And these are just some that um, I'm connected with. So reproducibility is an international effort. There's also um, the reproducibility networks, um, UKRN, and I know many, uh, there's a German reproducibility network and all these other places. Open Life Sciences, is um, a wonderful resource as well and also the Turing Way and the Turing Way is a, a community written handbook about how to do reproducible data science so um, if you've got any questions about anything to do with open science find the Turing Way and search in their um, online textbook and you'll have um, a great wealth of information and expertise available to you. So that's it, that's the story. So to kind of reinforce the, the messages that closed science or traditional science um, is susceptible to error and, and human biases and um, the open science is a way of making those, uh, making it harder to hide those kinds of biases and error. And remember questionable practices um, are very normalized I don't know anyone who hasn't done something that on reflection might not, hasn't been like, oh my gosh, I'm the most uh, honourable scientist ever, because it happens around you and, and it starts to become normal practice. But now you know, I just invite you to notice when these practices are happening and um, try and align yourself and, and um, make allies with the people who are also are aware of them. I encourage you to, as far as possible, publish your re research outputs to improve reproducibility and be aware that these will, publishing these things are increasingly mandated. So there will be going forward more and more pressure from funders and journals to share your outputs. And then finally, find strength in your community. Um, talk with people about this and um, it, this isn't a sole endeavor, it's a, it's a there's growing awareness and um, the more you can connect with other people who are aware of these issues, the greater influence we will have in addressing them. And I think that, there you go. And that was my last slide. So I'll leave the conclusions at that.